Good morning and uh, thank you for joining with us for our Sunday morning service, uh, but also the third meeting of our Holiness Convention. And uh, we've had a a wonderful uh, convention thus far, uh, two excellent meetings uh, there on Friday night and again last night. And uh, if this is is your first time to the convention meetings um, over the course of the weekend, then uh, you're in for a real treat uh, this morning. Uh, For we've very much enjoyed uh, the ministry of the word uh, by God's servant, the Reverend William Park. And uh, the Reverend Park is going to be sharing, of course, again this morning and then again um, this evening. But we're going to make a little start. We're going to sing our opening hymn, uh, 601 in Redemption Hymnal, if you're using a hymn book. Otherwise, the words will be projected above my head. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. We'll stand to sing, please. unite together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you uh, again, Lord, for all of your blessings uh, in our lives. Uh, You are a, a good God and a gracious God, a merciful God. Indeed, your mercies, uh, they are new every morning, and we rejoice even in that knowledge. Father, we want to thank you for the blessings of God that have been bestowed upon us, Lord, uh, even over the course of this weekend. We thank you, Lord, for your presence among us uh, there on Friday night and again, uh, Lord, there last night. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the ministry and song Uh, when Dean shared with us on Friday and John there last night. And we thank you, Lord, for the ministry of your word. We thank you, Lord, uh, for the theme of the weekend thus far. Uh, Lord, the fullness of the Spirit. And we pray, Father, this morning for your servant again today. And we pray that, Lord, you will undertake for him 
in this hour, and of course, Lord, this evening, when we would gather back again. But Lord, we think of this hour in particular, and we ask, O God, that you will undertake for him, that he, Lord, will know the help of of the Lord, even of the Holy Spirit, uh, to minister, to share, Lord, with us from the Word of God. Indeed, we pray that, uh, Lord, you will quicken him, enable him, anoint him, that, Lord, he might indeed uh, be conscious of divine help today uh, as he would stand, Lord, before us here and would open up uh, the pages of Scripture. Help us, Lord, ourselves as uh, we are gathered into this house. Help us, Lord, to truly worship you in spirit, Lord, and in truth. Lord, help us to offer up uh, those spiritual sacrifices of praise, uh, even as uh, we meet here in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray as well uh, that our hearts might be receptive, Lord, to the word of God, that we, Lord, might have hearts that are prepared and open Uh, And that, Lord, uh, should a challenge be presented to us here, uh, even in this hour today, that we, Lord, might be uh, obedient to the word of God, uh, that, Lord, we might indeed be uh, obedient to the promptings of the spirit of God, uh, that, Lord, we might respond uh, to your word and to the spirit, uh, Lord, as we uh, would uh, listen And, uh, Lord, we do pray that you would give us ears uh, to hear uh, what the Spirit would say to us today. And so we thank you again, uh, Lord, for this hour. And we pray that, Lord, you would uh, take control, that, Lord, you would uh, uh, bring about your purposes uh, in uh, this place this morning. We thank you that we serve a, a... a sovereign God. We thank you, Lord, that uh, all things are uh, under your control and uh, your dominion. And we pray that, Lord, your will then will be wrought in this place today. Father, we thank you for all who have gathered in. We thank you, Lord, for those who aren't ordinarily able to be with us due to advanced years, who are able to be with us even here today. And, Lord, we pray that we all might share in your blessing, even those, Lord, who can't be here, uh, due to advanced years, due to their health at this time. And we pray that, Lord, uh, they too might partake in some measure of the blessing of God uh, as, Lord, those who would worship with us uh, in this place ordinarily. And so so it is, Lord, that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again. Um, We're going to turn to 594, 594 in uh, Redemption Hymnal again. And uh, we're going to stand to sing uh, this hymn through. And immediately after we do so, uh, I'm going to uh, invite the Reverend William Park uh, to come and to share again with us this morning. 594, standing to sing, please.
Well, it's nice to see you back again and to be together on this Lord's Day morning to worship and to honor the Lord, and especially on this day, being uh, what's known as Pentecost Sunday, whenever we celebrate and we rejoice in the God sending His Spirit to the church. Uh, some call it the birthday of the church. But let's praise God today and let's worship together. It's been a joy to be with you over the weekend uh, so far, and we just thank God for his presence in the services. Uh, I really did feel that God was with us, particularly maybe last night. I just felt that good spirit, and I trust that it'll be like that this morning and tonight again. So make sure you come back tonight, and let's have a great final meeting for this weekend with Holiness Convention here in Balamina. Now, we're turning this morning, and we couldn't do anything else but turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. The account of the events of the day of Pentecost and the experience of the uh, the disciples on that uh, very momentous morning. Acts chapter 2, we'll read from verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, and the multitude came together, and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, the dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is about the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my spirit and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So far, ending at verse 21, and let us trust God for his blessing. Again, upon the public reading of his infallible word uh, to our heart here this morning uh, in our service. We gather here on this Sunday that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church uh, on the day of Pentecost. Now, of course, 
the Holy Spirit, that was not the beginning of the Holy Spirit, and that was not uh, when he first, he was known upon the earth long before that. Dr. Stephen Alford reminds us that we must remember there never was a time when the Holy Spirit was not at work in the world. He has permeated every age, influenced every generation, right up to the day of Pentecost. Uh, However, he said, we have every scriptural justification for stating that something new and unique happened at Pentecost. From then on, the Spirit became the dominant ally in the life of the early church. You see, just as Jesus existed long before he was born on this earth, uh, so the Holy Spirit is the eternal Spirit that we read of in Scripture. He was there right from creation because we read that it was the Spirit that moved upon the face of the waters uh, there in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 2. And time and time again, right throughout the Old Testament, we see something of his activity and his moving uh, right throughout that. But as we said here Friday night, during that Old Testament dispensation, the Spirit of God moved on individuals, certain individuals who were selected or by God for particular roles in leadership and in ministry within the Old Testament era wasn't everybody. Everybody didn't feel the Spirit. Everybody didn't hear His voice. Everybody wasn't uh, filled with the Spirit in those days. But this is different. This is Him coming in His fullness. This is Him coming as He was promised. And this is Him coming as the early disciples and the early church expected it. As Peter reminded them on the day of Pentecost, Joel had prophesied of this day that would come. We read about it in chapter 2 and verse 28 and onwards. And Peter said here that this is what God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. God said the day would come when it wouldn't be just selected individuals, as we mentioned on Friday night when we were speaking about Joseph in the Old Testament, but all flesh. Everyone could know and enjoy this great blessing of the fullness of the Spirit of God. This was entering in indeed to a new era. Or as uh, Stephen Alford said, we have scriptural justification that it was something new and unique happened at Pentecost. And from then on, the Spirit became the dominant force in the life of the early church. God intended it to be like that because we're still in that church age that started at the day of Pentecost. It will end, I believe, when Jesus comes and he takes his people home and he raptures his church. But we're still in that age. So we can expect and we can seek and we can know something of the movings in the Spirit of God, the dominance of the Spirit of God in our lives and upon the church. You see, not only did Joel prophesy this, but Jesus also promised it. He said that if I go, I will send you another comforter, an encourager. He said, and he referred to, he spoke of that one as being the Holy Spirit. He said that he dwelleth with you, but he shall be in you. That was something new and different. The Spirit of God dwelling in every one of them. And he's he's promised that it would come. John the Baptist also spoke of this day. Whenever Jesus was baptized, and he was pointing out Jesus, he said that he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, not many days hence. And so he spoke of this baptism, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was yet to come. 
And of course, the Lord Jesus spoke about it in John chapter 7. Remember when he said, on the last great day of the feast, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Out of his innermost being or out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit that should come. For he was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus hadn't been to the cross, purchased redemption and returned to heaven. And he said the Spirit had not yet been given in fullest measure. Uh, Jesus also said to them in Luke twenty four forty nine, Behold, I send you the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And of course, Acts 1, 8, as we know, he said that you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And so we see Pentecost is an event that was clearly predicted or promised or prophesied by Joel, by Jesus, by John. And not only that, but it was something that was experienced by the early church. And that's what we're looking at this morning. As we read in the Acts of the Apostles, time and time again, we read of God's people being filled with the Spirit of God. It happened for the first time here in Acts chapter 2. It happened again, time and again, and we're not taking time this morning to look at all of those passages when we read of that they've been filled with the Spirit of God. It happened to the Apostle Paul after his conversion. He went into the house of Ananias and he laid his hands on him and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord uh, sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we could go on and multiply verses as far as that was concerned. Not only was it something experienced, it was something exhorted to them and upon them. Last night we noticed in Ephesians where Paul exhorted Uh, prayed that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. And he exhorted them not to be drunk with wine wherein is excess, in chapter 5, 18, but to be filled with the Spirit. So we speak this morning on the experience of Pentecost. One that was prophesied and promised, one that was prayed for, and expected, and it was one, of course, that they had received and that they had experienced as well. Now I know there's much controversy sometimes over many things in this passage of Scripture, and uh, we probably will touch on some of those today. But we're not going to go into all the detail and get involved in too many of the arguments. But let me say I point out to you, there was many phenomena, many unusual things that took place at the day of Pentecost. We read that whenever, verse 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There are two groups of events that happened on the day of Pentecost. There were the external events that were transient. By that I mean there were events or elements or of happenings on the day of Pentecost that never happened again. It happened in Acts 2, but it never happened again. And then there were other events on the day of Pentecost that were repeated every time we read of people being filled with the Spirit of God. And I want you to to notice that and to get a grasp of that. The events that were transient, the things that happened on Pentecost... They passed away. They never happened again. They were all external. They were outward. The things that were permanent, they were internal. They happened within the heart of the disciples 
and of the believers and the 120 who had gathered there in that upper room. And uh, again, Dr. Stephen Alford has spoken of types and sim- how God uses types and symbols often to communicate eternal truth. We're well aware of that, of course, in the Old Testament. We're well aware of it in the ministry of Jesus where he spoke about parables, but he used uh, types in the Old Testament. All of the book of Leviticus is full of them, and uh, they all point forward to Christ, but they were things that people could see. They were external. They were outward. But one day they would pass away because they were fulfilled in Christ. The events that happened on the day of Pentecost were like that. You see, there were three things that I call external events that were transient. There was a sound that was audible. There was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Now, I don't think there was a rushing mighty wind. There wasn't that they felt a force going through that upper room. But the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Wind in scripture is often used as a symbol of power. And sometimes often as a symbol of life and of regeneration. And the Holy Spirit is depicted to us in various types and various uh, symbols throughout the scripture. Not only what we find here, but like a dove coming up on Christ and uh, like a river and so forth. But here is the sound of a rushing mighty wind. That was purely to symbolize the power that it brought. Now, we're all familiar with the power of the wind. Jesus said in speaking to Nicodemus, he said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. You can't see it, but he said you hear the sound thereof. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, we're all familiar with the wind. It's a very powerful force, isn't it? Uh, There at the end of January, we had a, a storm or a hurricane. I can't even remember now the name they put on it. They put names on these things these days. And, uh, but it was on a, sun, a Sunday, particularly a Sunday night. I remember it well because we were, had gone over to a meeting over in Ballygowan in County Down from where we live, and we were coming home. And uh, five times we had to turn and take another road because of a tree that, trees that were down across the road. It took us a long time. In fact, we had to go right back to uh, the road we came and then go down into Belfast and come up the motorway uh, to Lisbon and to Moira uh, in order to get home uh, safely. But every road we took, you know, we were coming the normal road and then uh, there was a tree down. We had to turn and go back and it took another road that we thought would take us back across and we weren't very far in there, we found another one. And then we went away on up by Balna Hinch and back down that road and uh, got near Lisburn and here there was another tree down. And uh, they directed us a road not far from it, a road I'd never been on. Went up there only about a few hundred yards and there was another tree down. And so it went. And then I got home and I found that the fence between us and the neighbor had been blown down as well. The power of the wind. Tremendous power. It's a symbol of the power of the Spirit of God. He comes to bring power to our lives. To give us power to live. To give us power to shine for Christ. To give us power to be what we ought to be and do what we ought to do. I think I did mention on one of the previous nights, the early church, they were being sent out to an impossible task. They were to go to a world that hated Jesus and they were to preach Christ. They were to go into the very city where he was crucified and preach him. They were to go to the Samaritans that hated the Jews And they were to evangelize. And they were to go to places they had never been and places they had never heard of. It was just impossible. 
And then they were men who were ignorant and unlearned men. They weren't particularly educated or skilled. But the power of God set them free, enabled them to do it. I remember reading some years ago uh, the biography of Usain Bolt. And uh, many of you remember him. He was three times world champion, a sprinter, three times gold medalist at the Olympics and uh, at the Commonwealth. At, Uh, at the Olympic Games as well. But he had reached the top of his career. He was winning everywhere and there was nobody could touch him. And so there was a couple of years before there was another big international athletics meeting. And uh, I think it was about 2009, 2010. And so he thought I'd relax for a little bit. He said, I'll not train as hard. I'll party some more, was his words. He said, I'll just take a bit of time for myself. He did keep up some training and that. But he said, then a year before the next games, he said, I'll be able to pick it up again. And he said, I'll start training. And he said, I'll just resume and pick it up. But whenever he started to train, he found that He didn't have much power. He went for the qualifiers for the 2012 Olympics in Britain. And he just qualified and no more. He said when he got to the line and they started off, he says the other sprinters went away ahead of him. What did he say? They had much more power than I had. He said, it suddenly dropped with me. Or he said, I never realized that I could lose so much power so quickly and not know it. Maybe there's a child of God here and you've lost the power of God in your life. And maybe you hardly know it. But you have. Thank God today for Pentecost that brings power. The second event or element that was transient, it never happened again, we read there were cloven tongues like as of fire that sat upon each of them. Now I'm told that that word sat is an interesting word in the the Greek. I don't know the Greek, but I'm told that it's interesting. I came up this morning and I sat down here in the pulpit. But that's not what that word means. It means to sit and to settle, to remain. Something that sits down to remain. I didn't intend to remain sitting in the pulpit this morning and I don't remain remain in the pulpit uh, for all of time in the future. (laughs) You see, the Holy Spirit, when he came, As those cloven tongues of fire, he sat upon each of them. But if wind is a symbol of power, fire, of course, has several symbolic meanings in Scripture. It means the presence of God. You remember Moses at the burning bush. It was a fire. The bush burned and was not consumed. Why? Because it was the presence of God in the bush. It has the meaning of passion. We talk about somebody being very fiery. They're passionate. They're enthusiastic. But it also has the meaning of purity and is often associated with purity. Remember Isaiah, whenever he was in the temple and he recognized his own uncleanness, God sent that angel to touch his lips with a live coal from off the altar and said, Lo, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is pardoned. God, fire, cleanses. Pentecost cleanses. And Pentecost brings fire. Thank God for that. Indeed. And then I must, because I must keep going here quickly, 
there was not only the fire that was visible and not only the sound that was audible, things that happened at Pentecost that never happened at any other time. Uh, There was the speech that was communicable. It says they spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, that's where we get into a little bit of controversy with how some people interpret this and other scriptures as well. It means languages. The word that is used there means languages. Languages they had never learned. Languages they didn't know. And whenever they began to speak, some of these people that were gathered from all over the world, from different countries and different nations, they all heard them speak in their own tongue or in their own language. It was undoubtedly a gift of languages. Now, whatever you make of the tongues passage in 1 Corinthians, uh, where Paul deals with that subject of tongues speaking in that church, uh, this was very definitely languages. A gift given to them to communicate the wonderful works of God to those who had gathered at Jerusalem. Let me say, also point out also in this, that this gift of languages, not everybody spoke in an unknown language. If you look again at that list of places where the people had gathered from, it says, verse 9, Parthians and Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mes- in Mesopotamia, and in Judea, in Cappadocia, and uh, in Pontus and Asia. Some of the people were Judeans. That was where Jerusalem was. That was the province round about. That was the language that the disciples would have spoken normally. So these people who from far distant lands were hearing in their language because there was people speaking in their language that they'd never learned. But there was people in Judea, and I would dare suggest probably the majority of that great crowd were from Judea, while there were visitors from all over the world. The most of them were from Judea, round about. They came up for the feast, Pentecost, up to Jerusalem. And they heard them speak in their own language which was the native language of the disciples. That tells me they didn't all speak with languages. They were all filled, but they didn't all speak with languages. And whenever you hear preachers say that on the day of Pentecost, tongues was a sign of the filling of the Spirit of God, and that If you don't have tongues, you don't have the filling of the Spirit of God. Some of them were filled, but they didn't have tongues. They didn't have languages. And I thought I would point that out just and share that with you as we go along. Why did God give them that gift of language? To communicate the wonderful works of God that people might hear. And isn't that what happens when the Holy Spirit comes? And that's what God wants to do in our lives. He may not give us the gift of foreign languages. He's given us the ability to learn them. And missionaries have gone to the mission field and they've had to spend years learning the language before they could start communicating. But that's what they do. But God gave them on this unique occasion. These things were external. They were all outward. And they were transient. They didn't happen every time when people were filled with the Spirit of God. But then there was the internal effects that were permanent. They were all filled with the Spirit of God. Now, last night, for those of you who were with us, and I'm sure those of you who were not with us, you had a good reason for not being here But we spoke something about the explanation of the Spirit-filled life. And how it is that God can come 
fill us with the Holy Spirit. It's not that there's a big hollow inside us and down our arms and down our legs and so forth and the Holy Spirit comes into us, our bodies, and he fills us. No. It's our personality. The Holy Spirit is a person. He has an intellect. He has emotions. He has a will. We, that makes up our personality as well. So whenever he comes in, because he's a spirit, he can penetrate our bodies. And because he is a person, he can permeate our personality. He takes control of our intellect, our mind. He takes possession of our emotions. And he also takes control of our will. I know I'm repeating what I said last night, perhaps in much shorter version. But that means that he controls my thoughts. There's no unclean thoughts. There's no rebellious thoughts. He gives me thoughts that enable me to grasp spiritual truth. My emotions, I will love the things that he loves. I will hate the things that he hates. My, his, what God feels is how I begin to feel. And our will, he enables us to obey from the heart and to do the will of God. That's what being filled means. Now we read that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That simply means this, that their lives became God-controlled. And Jesus became real to them. Because Jesus said that when the Comforter would come, he said that he shall glorify me. He said he shall take the things of Christ and make them real to you. You become God-conscious, God-filled. Jesus becomes very special and very wonderful to you. Why? Why? Because the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, takes possession and takes control and fills our life. We read in chapter 4, after they had returned from being imprisoned, they went to their own people, they told what happened, they prayed, and then we read in chapter 4 and verse 33, we read there, that they, were, that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, they had, the Spirit of God came upon them afresh there in that room where they were meeting. I'm trying to turn to it in my Bible here, but the pages are sticking together. And they're still sticking together. But you, you, you're familiar with the story I know, uh, there. It said that, and when they had prayed, the, verse 31, the place was shaken, where they were assembled, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart, one soul, neither said any that ought the things he possessed were his own, but they had all things common. And in verse 33, with great power, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There's part of the effect of a filling of the Spirit. Great power and great grace was upon them all. Oh, we need grace, don't we? We need Christians today that show the grace of God. Sometimes Christians can be hard and harsh and bitter. But that's not of the Spirit of God, because he is a gracious spirit. He fills our life, and so they received spiritual power, and their hearts were purified. In Acts chapter 15, verse 9, when they were rehearsing what happened at the house of Cornelius, when the Spirit came there, they said, God purified their hearts by faith, as he did with us at the first. Purified their hearts. He dealt with their sin. Minor James said, It's inconceivable that any indwelling sin can remain in the heart 
when the Holy Spirit is penetrated and fully possessed deep within. W. T. Perkisizer, the commentator, said, The divine spirit cleanses the heart. He fills by expelling all sin, and by his abiding presence he keeps it clean. So much for the internal effects of Pentecost. But as Pentecost is an individual experience, that is important. It sat the, we read of the tongues of fire that sat upon each of them. I don't know if they, realize, if they could see or recognize the fire sitting on themselves. I don't know if Peter knew there was a tongue of fire, a flame of fire sitting upon him. But John could see it. And John maybe didn't know whether it was an, he had the same experience or not, but Peter could see it. It sat upon each of them. You see, it was a very individual experience. And it's evident that the experience of Pentecost was more than just some kind of a mass movement, uh, touching a crowd or some kind of a collective experience. It was deeply personal to each one of them. They were all filled, every one, individually. The fire sat upon each of them. And of course, the Apostle Paul, whenever it happened to him, uh, we read there that uh, he went to the house of Ananias and he prayed for him that he might receive his sight, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a personal experience. It's not only an experience, it is a personal experience in that it is discernible experience. Uh, in Scripture, where this happens, people notice. You remember in Acts chapter 8, uh, the disciples have been scattered because of persecution after the death of Stephen. Whenever they were scattered and they, they went everywhere preaching the gospel, we read in Acts chapter 8. And Philip went down to Samaria. And there was a great revival and many, many people were converted. Amongst those who were converted, there was Simon the sorcerer. Uh, they, and he, whenever he was converted, uh, he joined himself to the church, to Philip. And then the church at Jerusalem heard about this and they sent down two of the uh, apostles just to check it out. To instruct them more fully. And whenever they came down, they spoke about the being filled with the Spirit. And we read that the Spirit of God came and he fell upon them. And when Simon saw that, he could see the power that this brought. Then he offered the apostles money. And he says, give me this power that whoever I lay my hands on will have this experience as well. Peter, of course, said, your money perish with you because your heart's not right with God. But he could see the difference that it made. You see, when a person is filled with the Spirit of God, you see the difference. You remember when Paul went to Ephesus and he asked them the question. He said, have you, rece have you received the Holy Spirit? Since you believed. They have been converted under the preaching of Apollos. Man mighty in scripture. But a man who didn't understand all of the truth. And so when they went, he went down and they, he asked them. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Why did he ask that question? I think it was. Because he could see in their lives. There was a deficiency. There was something lacking. He could notice these people, they don't have the fullness of the Spirit of God. They'd never heard of it. They said, we never heard. They hadn't heard the message. But you see, it's an experience that's discernible. It's individual, and it's individually discernible. 
But it's also an experience that is distinct. It's a separate experience. It's distinct from conversion. Yes, we receive the Holy Spirit whenever we're converted, but we're filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Now again, this is one of the areas when some people differ in their interpretation. And many will quote the verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, And in verse 13, uh, where there we read Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and he said to them, sorry, I'm looking, it's not 1 Corinthians, It it mustn't be verse 13, but you remember where he said that they were all baptized by one spirit into one body. And they said, well, that's the baptism of the spirit. And so whenever we read about Jesus baptizing with the Holy Ghost and with fire and Pentecost, it happens at conversion. Someone pointed out to me many years ago, and I found it very helpful. In baptism, there are three elements. Let's take the illustration of believers' baptism. There is the candidate who is the believer, the Christian. There is the baptizer, who's normally the pastor or elder. And there is the element in which they're baptized, which is water. Three distinct elements in baptism. Now, in 1 Corinthians and in chapter 12, Yes, I was looking at chapter 13. That's why I couldn't see the verse. I see it here now. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we bond or free, whether we have all been made to drink of the one spirit. By one spirit, we're baptized into one body. That's the the body of Christ. We become part of the body of Christ. Who are the candidates? The candidates are the convert. When we become a Christian, we be, we're baptized into Christ. We become part of the body of Christ. Who is the baptizer? It is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. And of course, the element is the body of Christ. Now, when John the Baptist spoke about Christ's baptism and what happened on the day of Pentecost, John said, "You shall be baptized, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Who is the baptizer there? It's not the Spirit, it's Jesus. What is the element there? It is the Holy Spirit that we're baptized with. And of course, it is the the, the disciple that was the candidate. You see, it's different. It's not something that we normally receive at conversion. We can. And sometimes it's possible. The Apostle Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. And then it was a few days later in the house of Ananias when Ananias prayed that he might be filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 9. When Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he said he was writing to those who, had be, who were dead in sin, but now had been quickened or made alive. And he said, by grace are you saved through faith, not not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, and so forth. He said to them in chapter 2, he said, You who were far off have been made nigh by the blood of Christ. And yet to these believers, with that kind of language you wouldn't doubt, but they were believers, he said to them, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. He prayed for them, that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. 
to those who were already saved. He was pointing out to them, he said, that the fullness of the Spirit of God, he said, is a blessing that's reserved for you. Perhaps we could say more to explain that, but time is gone. Let me say just as I close, it's not only a distinct experience, it's not only something that's discernible, something we know and we can see and we can witness, but it's a desired experience. We don't receive the blessing of Pentecost automatically after conversion. And not all who are saved will ever will know and do know the fullness of the Spirit. But it's a blessing we're to seek God for. That's why the disciples were to tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with power. That's why they waited and they prayed those ten days in that upper room. It's an experience to be sought after. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 we read, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Oh, I trust if you're not enjoying the blessing of the fullness of the Spirit of God in your life that you're hungry for it, that you have a thirst for God, you have a thirst for fullness, you have a thirst for the fullness of the blessing of God and the blessing of the Spirit of God. It's not only an experience to be sought, Remember Jesus said in John 7, that last great day of the feast, he said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Out of his innermost being or out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit. We've got to seek for it. We've got to thirst for this experience. But not only that, we must ask. Because we read in Luke's Gospel, For Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? We've got to ask. And finally, we must obey. Because we read in Acts 5.32, the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. Obey him. Not this morning in our service we bring it to a close. Let me remind you again that this is Pentecost Sunday. Yes, 2,000 years ago or something, God sent the Holy Spirit to the, upon the church, poured out the Spirit of God. There's none of them alive today, but the church is still in existence today. And that same experience of the Holy Spirit is what the church needs today. And we'll maybe say a little more about that tonight in the meeting, about the impact upon church life, witness, and ministry, and worship. But the church is made up of individuals. I trust this morning, as we have considered this afresh this morning, If you sense your need that you'll seek God, you'll get a hunger for God for the fullness of the Spirit in your life. I trust that you'll ask him definitely to fill you with the Spirit of God and that you'll obey him in everything that he says. May God bless his word to our heart here this morning. Thank you for listening so patiently, and I trust you will come back tonight as we conclude these meetings here in this convention. Thank you. God bless you, brother. We're going to turn to our closing hymn, five sorry, 252, 252 in Redemption Hymnal. And uh, we'll stand to sing, please, this hymn through. Thou, Thou Christ of burning, cleansing flame, send the fire. Thy blood, blood-bought gift today we claim, send the fire. We'll stand to sing, please.
to to ask that you might fill us, that you might fill our cups, uh, that they might be full and overflowing, that, Lord, you might indeed fill us with the, the power to serve, the power to bear witness, the power to live a holy life, a power to live a life that is pleasing uh, unto our God. Indeed, Father, we pray uh, that we might indeed... Uh, uh, that it might be discernible, uh, that, Lord, it might be recognizable, that we might even know the, the blessing of it, Lord, in our own lives, uh, and that, Lord, uh, we might indeed be able to impact uh, the world around us uh, for Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you will search our hearts, you will try our reins, and see if there be any wicked way in us. That, Lord, you would deal with any issue that we may have that might even impede the filling of the Spirit, Lord. In our own lives, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen.